Sciences and been part of each one of these 14 events as have some of the judges that we have up here that will be evaluating your your presentations today so before we give you more information on what the day holds for you or at least the morning holds for you we're going to give a couple of important announcements so bathrooms so right uh, this are right outside the door ladies on the left men on the right posters so does anybody have a poster that they need to still put up Okay, so how many people have posters out there today? There should be 48 of them. All right. It's a good chunk of you guys. All right. Um, so MCAT, there's Ron. Ron waved to everybody. Ron Scholl. So he's, he's uh, recording this. So MCAT uh, is recording this event, much like they have the last 14 of them, or 13 of them. So you'll be able to see this later on if you want to see yourself on, on camera as you give your presentation. We also have photographers that will be floating around. The reason I tell you that is you might be caught on camera at the, at the least uh, opportune time. So always be smiling, um, act like you're having a good time, and your parents will be very happy when they see you on, on TV. Okay? Uh, and also, we have lots of posters out there, so be sure, sure and visit all the posters that we have. And there's a uh, University of Montana Health and Medicine booth that's out there. So if you're interested in health and medicine and coming to the University of Montana or just learning more about health and medicine, go ahead and grab on those flyers and they would love to talk to you. All right, so here's what's gonna happen this morning. So I think we have a total of 10 presentations. Uh, we'll do six of them uh, in the first session. Then we're gonna take a break and we're gonna go look at posters for 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, we'll see how the time goes. And uh, we'll come back and we'll finish up the presentations after that. We'll do some quick evaluations. We'll have lunch. Uh, I think we have Jimmy John's coming in. So a lot of sandwiches for you guys. A lot of high-fiving out there. I like Jimmy John's. So Jimmy John's lunch, and then we're gonna come back in for awards ceremony. So for presentations, we have 10 total. So we're gonna do try to do six in the first session, take a break and do uh, the rest in the, the second session. We're gonna try to go six or so minutes per presentation with a few minutes afterwards. And we highly encourage questions, not only from the audience, but from our judging panel, because um, you guys put in the effort and have some really cool ideas and we wanna hear more about it. So we highly encourage questions. Um, we're gonna rank the top three. Actually, these guys are gonna rank the top three. And Third prize will get a $100 gift card. Second prize is a $125 gift card. And then the first prize is a $150 gift card. Sounds pretty cool. All right, so I am gonna introduce our, our judging panel. So we have a, a very experienced judging panel and two of them have been involved with all, each of the 14, which is hard to believe. So first off, I'd like to introduce Ronnie Flannery. She's with American Lung Association. So Ronnie, wave to everybody. <laughs> then next is uh, Mr. Ben Schmidt from the Missoula City County Health Department. <laughs> Does anybody remember the smoke from last summer? So uh, this is the guy that, that gets on TV a lot and talks about smoke in our area. So that's Ben Schmidt right there. Uh, Aaron Yost, so KPAX meteorologist. <laughs> And then Ms. Mary French, uh, staff scientist for Center for Environmental Sciences. And then Bobby Serban, he's a researcher here in our Department of Bio Biomedical and Pharmaceutical Sciences. Okay, so that's enough of me talking. So what, th the way this is gonna work is I'm gonna randomly pull up a presentation and when you see your presentation pulled up, then come on down. And then it, it'll be uh, time to, to, to do your little presentation, okay? Hello, my name is 
Christopher Erickson. I am Cole Henry. And I'm Conoyetto. And our project is Running From Bad Air. Okay, so we're all from the Corvallis High School. Our teacher is Mr. Hamill. And we're all part of the Corvallis Cross Country Team. So that's why our project is based off of um, the air quality in each of these running areas that we participate in. Okay, so our hypothesis is um, what areas in the Bitterroot Valley have the best air quality for a runner? So we hypothesize that the Western Mountains would have the best air quality because of their elevation. And we think that the higher elevation will contain less pollutants because the smoke from the valley's wood stoves don't reach these mountainous because of the eastern blowing winds. So our testing methods, we use the Dylos air quality monitor to measure and record the air quality. We used a hygrometer to measure the humidity and then test it for 10 minutes on the paths or roads where we'd run. Okay, so these are the locations that we went to, as you can see on the yeah, far right. Uh, those were the highest elevation places that we went to. And then towards the center of the map, you can see the yellow, orange, and red places. Those were some of the lower elevation places that we went to. And then places like Grantsdale, those were also more data that we collected. So the results of our experiment being that uh, right at the lowest elevation, the Chapman Road, was actually the worst place we had for air quality, which kind of went with our hypothesis, but also the Western Mountains, as you can see, the pink one was along with it one of the highest, so that being the highest elevation place we went to, it was also not that great for air quality compared to the other places. And to see what place was the best overall and what was the worst, we averaged all the data together and found that Eastern Mid Elevations was the best and Chaffin Road turned out to be the worst. So this tells us that we should spend more time running on the Eastern Mid Elevation trails and less time on the Western Mountains and Chaffin Road to get the best air quality. Okay, so what we would have done differently is we would have used multiple pumps at the same time for different locations to gather more data for more accurate results. And then we would have gone out throughout more of the year to get a better data range to further improve our results. Okay, questions? Did you all do one reading per location or multiple readings per location? Um, we did multiple readings per okay. location. Yep. How many? Um, three. Three for each location? Yep. And then they were just like average? Yeah. Five. Yeah, for our groups. Okay. Anyone else? Any questions from him? Yeah. And I might have missed this, but which, during which time frame did you take the measurements? On uh, March 15th. Is it winter or spring? <laughs> uh, we took all of our data on March 15th. Okay. We went to each location for that. Yep. Um, what do you think would have happened if you took the data during the winter months? Just curious. Um, actually, you know, not that. Not that. <laughs> I, I would assume that we'd have higher amounts of PM 2.5 because wood smoke and all the pollutants from people heating their houses during the winter. So just to follow up on her question, you did them all on March 15th, but you did three readings. Is that like, did you do morning, noon, and night, or did, were they different times of that day? Yeah, they were at different times. Okay. Yeah. Were they, well, <laughs> I was wondering how different they were, for, like in the morning to the evening. Um, yeah, so we started in the morning going to the track, and that was our starting area. So it progressed through to the night. So the morning were the months. lowest and all of yeah. Any other questions from the students? We got extra goldfish. <laughs> <laughs> question. 
all on your graph, all the lines except two seem to spike around the same time. Do you know a reason for that? Yeah, it could have just been a gust of wind at any given time. There's not really anything I can tell you about that. One of the spikes that we had on Chaffin Road was a truck driving by. So there's things like that that we'd be affected by running because of the exhaust. So it just adds into a data. Any more questions? All right, thank you. Chase Nielsen. And we're from Capitol High School and we are here to ask the question, how does the soil type into which a well is drilled affect the radon concentration in water coming from that well? And now I know you're probably wondering why we're talking about uh, radon in water instead of in the air. Well, the truth is anytime you uh, use water in your home, whether it's flushing a toilet or turning on a faucet, the, most of the radon that's dissolved into the, your water supply goes out into the air. Even though it's not directly seeping in through the earth, it is coming out of that water. So we wanted to look specifically at the water coming from these wells. So just some quick background information here. Really there is three major types of soil in the Helena area. Um, that being quaternary sediments, tertiary sediments, and the boulder batholith area. Uh, the state of Montana water quality standards list a human health standard of 300 pico curies per liter for radon in groundwater. And the EPA estimates that radon in drinking water causes 168 cancer deaths per year. 89% of these coming from lung cancer that you are breathing in after the radon leaves the air, and then the rest of that coming from stomach cancer from the consumed water. Uh, furthermore, uh, research done by the USGS shows that granite has higher concentrations of radioactive elements than most other soil types. And that is going to be uh, granite that is mostly making up the soil and the bedrock of the boulder batholith. So that would be one factor for why there would be more radon in those areas. However, we believe that the tertiary and quaternary sediments, due to the fact that they have more permeable soil, would be better conducive to having more radon in the water. So, Okay, so here is our map of the areas we tested. In this area right here is the quaternary sediments. This is the tertiary, and down here is the boulder path of the area that we tested. All right, so these would be three typical well logs um, from a house in each of these sites. So on the top left, you have somewhere that would be in the Helena Valley with that quaternary sediments. It's mostly just gravel, sand, loose sediments that uh, radon would be very easily able to seep through. Uh, basically the same for the tertiary sediments that was in the east. And then on the bottom, you can see the boulder backlift area that's basically just a feet or a couple feet of topsoil. And then under that, it's just pure grain. So basically our hypothesis was that if wells are drilled into these tertiary or quaternary sediments, due to the fact that these soils are more permeable and radon is a gas, that it will be able to have more radon in their water supply, despite the fact that these granite uh, bedrocks will have more radioactive material, we believe that would be outweighed by the fact that these more permeable soils would allow for more radon to seep through. Okay, so for our procedure, we uh, contacted Energy Labs in Helena, and they were able to give us 10 free samples. And so, they have a specific way that you have to do that, and it's, you have to, uh, so you fill up a bucket of water, and you completely submerge the tube in it, and you uh, open the lid, and you let water in so no air can get in, and then you seal it up, and you take it back to the lab, and then they send it in. And we chose three different soil types in the Helena area to which we were going to take samples from. And then we took the samples all on the same day. And then once the 10 kits were finished, we sent them in. And then we got our results. So some sources of error we identified that in our process might have changed the data. 
Um, one especially would be the depth of the well, because if a well is drilled through more soil, then that's more soil that would be possibly able to leak radon into that water supply. And then also um, an article from the EPA talked about how dissolved oxygen gas concentration in water and also the pH of the water can also affect how much radon that water can hold. So this is our data table that we got back. So essentially the top three you have there out in the valley, those are those quaternary sediments. And as you can see, they're fairly high. Um, the city tap water came up with no detectable radon. Um, then in the east, you have a little bit higher. And it actually found out that it was the opposite of what we thought our hypothesis was going to be. Uh, besides that one outlier there in Jefferson, the other two valleys are, values are clearly much higher than the other ones at 3,050 and 6,050 cubic curies. Per liter. So clearly you're, we are seeing that in that granite area, in, on the boulder back lift, uh, there is a much higher amount of radon-222 dissolved in that water. So this is a graph just representing that to visually, visually show how there is a lot more in this area than there is in the soils in the north and the east. Okay, so we came to the conclusion that the data that we acquired does not support our hypothesis because we thought that the more porous soil types would be able to hold more radon, but it was very clear that the boulder batholith had the highest concentrations of radon. All right, these are our sources cited, and uh, just a special thanks to Energy Labs. It was going, uh, usually they do $75 per radon sample, but they gave us 10 for free, so that was really helpful to our research. And other than that, that is our presentation. Are there any questions? Yes? How do you think there was more in the ground? Um, once again, going back to our original background information, it has been shown by the USGS in several surveys that granite rock types and bedrock do have much more high concentrations of radioactive elements such as uranium and thorium. And then just through the process of radioactive decay, those would turn into radon gas, which would seep through it. However, we just thought in our hypothesis that that fact would be outweighed by the more permeable soils. Yes. Yeah, did you check the pH of your samples? We did not. Uh, yeah, so that's why we thought that it would be a factor that could have possibly changed. Yes. What do you think happened to that one outlier in Jefferson, just considering um, the other two were so Well, high. we did find out that that well was a lot deeper than the other, so it might have been there was more time for the water as it was coming up through the well to release the gas. Um, that's one thing that you see with the city tap especially, uh, just from the time that it's extracted to the time it gets to your faucet, really all that radon has time to get out of the water. So that might have had something to do with that. Other than that, we're not totally sure. Question from the eyes. I found a thanks for rice crispy tree thing. <laughs> this is real. Do you have a question? Yeah, I just think you mentioned how porosity would really damage both your wells. Some of the wells were in bedrock. So how did you account for porosity compared to the parent material that is the wells were in bedrock versus the uh, Can you rephrase the question? I'm sorry. Okay, so how do you measure soil porosity? <laughs> Um, I guess, really, I didn't have anything to particularly measure it. I can say, however, that in general, it's definitely true that the quaternary and tertiary sediments were much more porous than just the solid granite bedrock, because as those soil logs showed, it was mostly gravel and silt and clay. Oh, the wells, we don't know how deep each one was, so once again, that would definitely be a source of error in our project. We don't know how deep all of them individually were. Uh, can you speak up? Our control group. So we took a sample of the city tap, which we knew would, uh, by the time it reached here, we believed that it would have all the radon go off, and it did. And furthermore, when uh, Radon or when Energy Labs does their testing, they do their own samples that are controls. They have samples that they know have radon and they put them in there. We just didn't think we needed to put that in here because they do that when they test it themselves. All right.
should announce like who is here today. What what schools do we have? So Big Sky High School. Where's Big Sky? All right. Libby High School. Okay. So Libby's in the back. Capital High School. All right. Corvallis High School. <laughs> oh, that's Team Spirit. Um, Anaconda? Yeah. All right, there's Anaconda. St. Andrew's School in Valley? Yeah. All right. Valley Christian? Yeah. All right, okay. This is Ethan, and that's Oliver. We are from Big Sky High School, um, and we did our uh, tests on radon levels in Missoula Homes. All right, so we decided that um, we would test our houses, each of our houses, for different radon levels. So as you can see, mine is in the far uh, left corner. Um, I live in a regular size trailer, so my house is pretty small compared to Ethan's. As you can see, Ethan's is 3,000 feet squared, and mine is uh, 1,216 feet squared. Um, and so, and then Oliver doesn't have his in here, so let's have him explain. Uh, mine was 1350, but uh, I put it in and I didn't get so <laughs> <laughs> um, So, what we decided to do, so, we each went through and decided um, a couple places to test um, the houses, our houses. So for me, I'm on, I'm on the way other side, but I decided to test, um, it's gonna be the top end and then the middle of the back end of my trailer was having some renovations done. So I thought that might affect the date and I didn't want to test it there. Um, and I decided to test it at the back end in the middle because there's um, different types of like Soil and stuff like the front has more of our gardening stuff, and then the middle has more of just the regular grass and the trees and stuff. And so, mine, you can tell it's in the middle there. Uh, I put mine down in the basement uh, in my room, which I thought would affect it since it's more underground than the rest of the house. And I also put it in, in the upstairs um, in the guest room because I wanted to get a uh, differ, uh, different readings for, from different parts of the house. Mine's a lot like Bree's, but a little bit wider. Uh, I put mine in a larger room than a smaller room. Um, so our question was, how do different types of houses affect the level of radon? So as I said, I live in a trailer. Ethan lives in a regular sized house, I would say. And then um, Oliver also lives in a trailer, but it's, as I said, it's a bit wider than mine. Um, so we knew that radon um, comes from the soil and it can be, I wouldn't necessarily say the oh, but it's different types of soil can affect um, the radon level. And I live in a trailer court, so I have less land and soil surrounding my, um, home rather than Ethan. Ethan has more soil and he has like a whole backyard that could affect his um, his radon levels. So um, our hypothesis was if the house is larger and uh, feet squared and is on a larger plot of land, then the radon level will be higher um, because of the so how much soil is around the house and the way the house is built. So how we started this is we obtained uh, uh, knowledge of how um, the area of our houses. So we took that into consideration when choosing where to put these testers. And then uh, we borrowed a tester from our teacher, Mr. Jones. Uh, we borrowed them for a seven day period, plugged them in and let them do their thing. 
So we, what, how we did this, um, so here's all of our raw data. So what we did is we plugged them in, and then every day after school or any time, um, the number would change. We would take it down that just that way so we had numbers to evaluate each day. And then, of course, after a 48-hour period, the radon tester gives you an exact number of the average amount um, between the two days. But we wanted to make sure we had enough data and had um, a good, um, I'm going to repeat myself, oh, sorry, a good amount of data um, to ensure that our test was going right and to ensure that we were on the right track. So this is our process data. So the average of each day was put into each of our uh, respective uh, rows. And then we took a graph of the averages and put them into, um, into this on the right here. Um, and so we did two testing periods. As you can see, we did November and then in January. And November, it was still more of the fall months. It was just kind of heading into more winter. So we got, we tested then to see if like the weather or whatever had affected um, the soil, so the radon amount. And then we tested it in January when we had snow and the ground was more frozen over to see if radon levels would decrease um, because the ground is frozen and there's not going to be as much um, going into the soil. <laughs> so, and res uh, our results actually supported our conclusion. Um, so, it ended up being that the house with the larger amount of area actually did have a higher amount of radon. That's it. Any questions? Yeah. Why do you think the radon levels were greater in the more wintry months than it was in November? Um, so my belief and what I believe happened was that since the ground was frozen, the radon gas couldn't escape into the atmosphere as easily as it had in the fall months. So it was trapped in the soil more and there was more surrounding the houses so the radon levels would increase. Any other questions? Oh, there's two. Yep. All of your items have rooms that are actually in the ground. Yes, only my house actually had uh, rooms that were in the, or somewhat in the ground. I have a basement below my house, and these two don't, so. I would be the only one. Oh, uh, yeah, it definitely could have. For sure. Yeah. How are your houses like in trailing and sea mushrooms in the ground? Like, how are they going to the ground? Do you live in 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 the ground? For ours, um, our ground is, it's tore up more. It's just placed. So my trailer is on, um, they place them on something like cinder blocks or cement blocks, and then it's just kind of placed into the, onto the ground. Um, so there is loose soil under um, my trailer, I, I know. Uh, since my house has a basement, uh, it was dug into the ground. Mine's got a base of cement that was dug into the ground. Yeah, actually, so the November readings were from the upstairs, and the January readings were from the basement. Any other questions? Any more questions?
Albany and this is Kaylee and our experiment is which meat is the worst to cook. So. Is it on? Is it on? Yes, it's on. Okay. So our background is uh, cooking meat is a source of atmospheric air pollution. Emission inventory estimates indicate that 31,000 restaurants in Los Angeles, California discharge around 11.6 tons of particulate matter pollution from meat cooking daily. Cooking meat is also a source of indoor pollution. So our question is, which meat produces the highest PM 2.5 levels when cooked? Turkey, pork, sausage, or chicken? So our hypothesis is that we believe chicken will produce the lowest PM 2.5 numbers because it's a more lean and unprocessed meat than pork sausage or turkey. So our experiment, we used the Dilos air monitor. Um, we cooked in a frying pan on the stove. So we did a slice of turkey, some sausage link, and a slice of chicken method. We put the monitor next to the stove on the counter. We cooked, it was about two feet away from the pan, roughly. Um, then we had, the, we did each meat on a different night and then we let the monitor run, turn it on right before we cooked, and then had it run as we cooked, and then let it run a little bit after we were finished. So here's our data. The red is the sausage, the blue is the turkey, and the green is at the bottom, which is the chicken. And you, as you can see, the turkey and the sausage, yes, are <laughs> uh, way higher than the chicken. So, okay, so the chicken produced the lowest, as you can see on the graph, and here are some averages. The average for the turkey, turkey is the highest, sausage is in the middle, and the chicken is way lower than the others. Our conclusion, um, our hypothesis was confirmed. Cooking chicken does produce lower PM 2.5 levels than cooking pork sausage or turkey. Chicken produces lower PM 2.5 levels because it is less processed and more lean. Areas of improvement in future tests, running multiple tests with each type of meat to provide more accurate data, testing with more types of meat, example, steak, ground beef, or fish, testing in an environment that hasn't been cooked in for at least 12 hours before the test. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I go ahead and ask How many ounces of meat do you use for each type of chicken? For me, for the chicken, I just use one chicken breast sliced up. So yeah, we just use slice up chicken breast and then a piece of turkey meat and then just sausage links sliced up. I don't know, we didn't really measure. Yeah, any other questions? Like in the front. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, okay, so um, your statement was that um, meaner and more, less processed meat should produce less than the uh, 2.5 levels. Yeah. So if you tested something like hamburger or um, something that was like trying to be like factory processed, yeah. so ground meat, would you think, would you expect it to have? It would probably, yeah, the more processed, we predict that it's going to have more to the PM level, like higher PM levels. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. yeah, you said you tested before starting to cook each time. What were the results for those three? The, will you say that again? Um, you said you um, tested the air prior to beginning yes. the cooking. And what were the results from those three tests? Um, in the graphs, um, you, could, if you mainly see it with, yeah, we can go back. You mainly see it with the blue one. This is like you didn't start kicking to like here, and then it spiked up because of the kicking. Um, and then, not really for um, the sausage. It, it, this is after kind of we looked on after a long time to see if the kicking was a, like the main reason it spiked. So. Oh, goodness. As a vegetarian, I would have been interested in seeing what, what would have happened if you would have just done a baby stir fry. Oh, done stir fry? We actually thought of that, too, like add stir fry in, but 
we just went with meat. Um, any other questions? We'll go in the back. I don't know. Um, we actually um, we did three different things. So um, when I cooked it, I had the monitor on a little bit before. I had a test run through. I waited a little bit, then I I did it three different times. So yeah, we wanna we'll get you here. I just have a question about the um, cooking, the heat source and the additive. So did you all use um, like either a gas stove or electric stove? Or did you all use oil or no oil? Or what were the differences between heating sources and kind of at cooking additives? Um, I used a gas stove, so that might. Yeah, I used a gas stove. I, I used a gas stove. So also. we all use gas stoves. So. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I used some butter. I don't know. Um, I used oh. avocado oil in mine just for like for long time. I, I guess I put a little butter in the pan to see if so that could have some results for it too, have a difference. We should have maybe tested it with and then without to make it a little better too. Um, here we go. <laughs> we'll go back. Yeah. You got to speak up. can't hear you. I still can't hear you. <laughs> No, we didn't. We each did a different meet at each of our houses. Um, the girl next to you. We just cooked it till they're fully cooked. That one right there. Where? There? Okay. I don't know who wants to go. How do you know that it was because it was less processed and um, more of a lean, but it had a lower particulate matter? on the effectiveness of dust mass on limiting particulate matter. Okay, so we picked this experiment because pollution is a big problem, uh, especially in today's world. According to the World Health Organization, about there's, in 2014 they estimated there are about 7 million premature deaths because of air pollution. Um, only 91% of cities that monitor their air quality meet the guideline for WHO, which is about 25. Uh, was it you, Libra? Per, in the 24 <laughs> hour period and then 10 annually. Um, in addition, about half the urban population lives where levels are at least 2.5 higher, 2.5 times higher than the recommendation. So this is a map of air pollution we got from NASA in areas, and as you can see, they correspond with more urban areas where popula population density overlaps. So um, in Asia, India, Northern Africa, 
population, there's a lot of population density that overlaps with the particulate matter, which is results of urbanization. So this is a bit of background on masks. No, it's, no, it's the wrong it's one. The wrong. Oh, so this is the wrong background, but I'll tell you about it. So the idea of mass has been around for a really long time. Around the first century AD, the Romans started suggesting using uh, animal bladders to cover the face during mining for oxide dust product, uh, protection. So, and then around then, 14th century, people in London were uh, mass bringing to prevent against London smog. So masks are extremely important. A lot of uh, masks are worn in urban areas, especially in cities, especially in China. You see that a lot. It's very popular in the media. There's lots of questions online of, should I wear a mask? Is this dangerous? Kind of, what do I do when there's a lot of pollution? <laughs> Um, so our hypothesis was if we use th um, three different types of particulate matter emitters, in our case we used an aerosol, which was PAM, and then flour and smoke from a candle on three different brands of masks, then the brand 3M will block out the most particulate matter just because it's uh, thicker, more durable, and the most commonly found brand. So in our experiment, our independent variable was the type of mask we used. We rotated between all three masks. And then our dependent variable was the amount of particulate matter detected by the dialysis. Um, in our control of the group, we had two dialysis, one with a mask over it and one without right next to each other so that we could see right next to each other the comparison between the two. Let's get back. Okay, so we, we would turn on both of the dialysis at the same time and then we would um, place and hold one mask over the first dialysis to make sure that the least amount of particulate matter could get into it. Uh, we would spray the aerosol or um, clap the flower or burn the candle from 12 inches away for 10 seconds for each one. And we recorded the data using um, our phones. We videoed it so that we could see um, all the particulate matter. And then we would repeat it with each brand three times so that we could get an average overall. So these are our results for the pan. And then you'll see we also have um, graphs for the uh, flower and the candles. And the only thing here is the scale is a little bit different on each of them so that you can see uh, the difference the best. But um, overall, the no mask had the most particulate matter, and then um, the 3M kind of held in the particulate matter the most. Oh, okay, next one. Okay. <laughs> so right here is kind of the, um, like at the end of the experiment, after the 10 seconds, these are the final readings. The red line represents what the um, re health recommendation is for particulate matter. Um, so you can see that even with the masks, all of the levels remained above what the recommended, recommended levels are. Um, so we found that all of the um, levels with the dialysis with the no mask were higher, um, but all of them remained above what the safety levels were. Um, and what we thought was the most durable mask we found actually held in the particulate matter over time, or at least seemed to. Um, so this could have been um, this could have been from how the mask actually fit over the dialos. Masks are designed to fit over a human face, not a dialos machine. So it doesn't quite fit how it normally would, which could have affected the readings. So these are our sources. <laughs> Yay, lots of sources. Okay, any questions? Yeah. <laughs> It could have. Um, we tried to make sure that the distance where we were um, emitting the um, particulate matter was um, the same for all of them. We measured that everything was 12 inches away, so everything was the same distance, so that everything would be accurate and controlled. We're also testing the mass effectiveness. We don't have like as many resources as we would have liked to. If we had more time with the dialysis machines, we would have done more testing and done farther distances and gotten more data, but you're unable to. Did you do the test 
tests one after the other. So did you go straight from like the smoke to the pan or to the flour? Did you give it time to let the particulate matter settle? So we did give it time. What we did was we tried to get to the readings as much as normal as they were. So they got about the same like average as they were before the reading. We also switched rooms, but we also made sure that accounted for was the average for both of the machines was the same. So we accounted for that the beginning, it was the same for each one, not the same beginning average. So it wasn't off the same beginning scale. That was accounted for in the data show. Yes. Yeah. Any questions? After doing this, do you recommend wearing a mask during like five school? Wearing a mask. So one of the things that we should have, if we had more time, what we would have done was use different masks. Because what we did use was we used very common ones that were disposable ones. Now there are better masks out there that are better respirators, that have uh, external valves, and so air can be exchanged better. We tested the most common disposable ones, so I would say that depends on what mask you use. Uh, one of the common rating systems when you buy masks, like just generally ones, is that it will have a HEPA rating or not. Do you know if any of these had that HEPA rating? Were they fine or of course ridiculous? We don't know that exactly, but we do know that they didn't meet the N95 one where they filter 95% out. We're not exactly sure. We don't think they did because they did not have the stamping on the packaging. So we don't know if they filtered the 95% out. We think not. So. N95 will, will get fine yeah. yeah. That is, that would be fine for Why did you choose this for your experiment? Like, what was your motivation for it? So when we were picking our ideas, we were asked to brainstorm a couple, and we went through them, and we kind of like, oh, these are all experiences that we could test, but kind of what's really a big question that affects not only us, but people around the world, and as we, we experience changing environments and extreme pollution and urbanization, it's a very big question of what do we do with our air safety. Any more questions? Thank you. <laughs> Schultz and Arlie Burner when we go to Capitol High School. You need to speak up. Yeah. You're not even yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. So. So, for our introduction, we did it, uh, in multiple articles. It is commonly stated that there is a direct correlation with increase in temperature and a decrease in elevation. To increase in particulate to the increase of particulate matter, but also it is commonly said that particulate matter is altered due to the change of seasons and the weather along with them. So we ventured out to McDonald Pass to see if it was actually true. And for one day for the three seasons, fall, winter, and spring, we would take readings at the bottom and the top of the pass with 20 minutes apart. Each reading consisted of 10 minutes and one reading per minute. During our experiment, we ran into varying different, very differing weather conditions like rain, snow, and heavy cloud cover. And we think that could have also affected the results. So my hypothesis was uh, when particulate matter is tested on a down pass during the fall, winter, and spring, and the highest reading taken from the dialogues would be in the fall because of smoke dust and other aerosols carried over from the summer months. Also, the lowest reading would be spring due to the rain and cool temperatures, causing little to no forest fires and keeping the dust on the ground. Okay, so. From researching scientific articles, we found that there is a definite correlation between particle matter and the elevation the data is taken at. Another interesting concept is that tests have shown particular matter is more prolific in some months more than others. Due to these articles, we wanted to test and see if these statements were true on McDonald Pass, a passage over the Continental Divide a few miles outside of the town of Helena, Montana. So our question was, 
what is the difference in my particular matter at the base of McDonald Pass and at the top during these seasons of fall, winter, and spring? In which of the seasons had the highest and lowest PM at the time of tests? So for the reading in the fall, at the bottom of McDonald Pass, it had a higher level than at the top, with the exception of two or three points, where the top is higher at the bottom. And none of this was surprising to us, because it was warmer at the bottom of the pass than the top, and that cold air was probably pushing the particulate matter into the valley and under the altitude of the top of the pass. And the temperature at the bottom of the pass was in the mid-30s, and the top of the pass was in the high teens. You, you can see bears are terrible. Then in the winter, we measured the same locations as before, and again, the results didn't surprise us. The bottom of the pass, a little bit of higher PM, 2.5 over than the top, and the temperature on that day was in the single, single digits at the top of the pass, and the bottom of the pass had low to mid 20s with clear skies, which could have contributed to the levels being lower. Now, um, for spring, analysis, it did surprise us because the bottom actually had a lower level of PM than the top. And we could attribute that to, it was raining pretty heavily that day, it was pretty thick cloud cover, so there was more sure of what particular matter in the air because of that. In conclusion, we discovered that particulate matter levels do vary with altitude, but we are still unsure about whether particulate matter will vary in the seasons. This is very interesting because for some reasons uh, for high particulate matter in April, because maybe because of the warm weather. There was heavy cloud cover with rain on that day as well, which could have affected the level of particulate matter. Some reasons for low particulate matter in February could be the low degrees and higher altitude are pushing the particulate matter down to lower altitude with the warm air like an inversion. Some pieces to change in the next experiment are taking more readings during each season, like such, a, uh, such as a couple every month, uh, and be able to know whether we can have still similar patterns for each reading we take. We could also attempt to find a different spot where the particulate matter levels would be unaffected by passing vehicles, which is something that we struggled with because we were right next to the highway taking the readings. In the, exp in the end, our experiment proved our hypothesis partially incorrect. The data shows fall having the highest level at the bottom of the pass, but at the... Put it in the spring at the top of the pass. Okay, at the spring at the top of the pass, had the highest level. And there are our references. Any questions? Actually, during our experiment, it was actually snowing at the top of the pass, but it was not a mix. Yeah, it was a mix of snow and rain, but at the bottom of the pass, there was no precipitation. Also, when we measured at the bottom, it was not raining as hard as when we got to the top. It was like Joe's going to switch to study. Um, so when you guys went to the top of the pass, did you go out to the like, workout area up there? The, yeah. The Crom Optics and Campground that's right on top. And then at the bottom, we just pulled out that old sort of MDT area. So we were off the highway the bowling pool. Still close enough. Um, high fives for your topic, go meteorology. Um, but also, <laughs> I was curious, did I see that on every single one of your readings for each season that it was colder at the top of Mac Pass and it was warmer at the bottom of Mac Pass? In the spring, it was similar. The same? It was 50s? It was, yeah, it was higher 50s at the bottom and above 50s at the top. Okay. So my question is to you, because McDonald Pass is notorious for having crazy inversions yeah. where it's actually warmer up high during the winter months especially and then cooler in the valleys, if that would have had any effect on your readings and if you thought that would be something to be look at in the future too. Well, I think in the winter, we got lucky and it was just a little more cold in town, more than a lot but you know, that would be do you, What kind of readings do you think you would get if you got like a day with an inversion? based on what you've researched. I think that it would probably be higher at the bottom because if the warm air is trapped in the lower elevations, so would also the particle matter. That's what I'm thinking. Oh, thank you.
Almost all counties have the high radon level concentrations, especially where we are in Lincoln County and in Libby. We are above the four peculiar liters. Now what is radon? Uh, it is a colorless, odorless, radioactive gas produced by decaying ur uranium. Uh, so most everyone should know that by now because we, well, hopefully everyone. We've um, had more than one. Slide with this going on. <laughs> um, it's an ionizing radi it's ionizing radiation in the form of al alpha rays, and what and it's one of the leading causes of lung cancer in non-smoking individuals. And with such high ratings in our school, we thought that we would take in it into our hands to try to figure out what's going on. So the questions we had were: Will there be any patterns in radon levels with regards to classroom locations due to we have some areas with high concentration, some with low. And does the amount of ventilation, aka the amount of doors we have per classroom, affect each rate on levels we have in those classrooms? Our hypothesis was that if classes have more ventilation, then the rate on concentrations will be considerably lower than those with higher, um, higher ventilation. All right, so our procedure was is we got a map of the school and we wanted to pick out 14 different rooms. In each room, we put a detector in for 48 hours because that's what our detectors were. Uh, and we left it in, like I said, we left it in there for 48 hours and we did three tests each in each room. And this was over a period of January to about March. Again, it's not very accurate readings, but we did what we could. And this is our layout of our school. As you can see, the redder coloring is the higher readings and the low, blue are the lower readings. So our results vary drastically. Um, considering the number of doors, we didn't see any correlation. So we looked at the individual wings, as you can see. We separated our averages um, to wing so that we had them in classroom location. And so we also consider, as you can see, like um, the one with three doors had 2.0, but the one with um, two had 6.3, so we couldn't really make any conclusion based on that. All right, so our results uh, left, sorry, um, were, like she said, it was very, very drastically. So we could not really have very accurate distinguishing on whether our, our hypothesis was supported. So again, we there was no correlation. And again, our conclusion, our hypothesis was not supported. But later on into our testing, we had discovered that under our school, there were crawl spaces. And they all over under our school. And in here, and throughout the school, you can see this little black dot that's in room 31, and the arrow's pointing down to it. That's where we actually came, in, came into the crawl spaces and found them out. And we did the readings, and the, right, the average readings for that was 56.6. 
And that is 14, almost, that's about 14 times more, about 14 times more than the average baseline of 4.0 pico, pico curies. So then we started thinking, well, maybe this is a reason why our school is having such high readings. But ultimately, we ran out of time to figure if that was our reasoning. So. All right, so possible sources of error we had could have been possibly the age of our radon detectors, because usually with those type of radon detectors, you change them out every seven years. Ours was definitely older than seven years old. So that could possibly be it. And then we had weather temperature fluctuations because we had such a broad time of things. The weather changed from being really rainy to like either being really extremely cold or being sunny. And because the, during the winter, the ground freezes and then it makes it harder for the radon to seep through. So it'll go to the easier path, the path of least resistance, which would be your housing areas, which, and, which is why radon concentrations during the winters is such higher than during the spring or summer and any of those reasons. And also radon's brought in when you're bringing in air to heat your rooms, which also is why when professionals do radon testings, they do it during the winter. And then also we couldn't really control the type of foundations. We had, we have an old school, so the foundation in certain areas has certain cracks that probably allow radon seep through easier and then maybe in other places they have newer foundation. So you really can't control how much radon's going in through those cracks. And then, of course, with the soil type, that's also an effect we have, because with the crawl spaces, you had no foundation, it was just a dirt floor, which made sure the radon was easier to be collected from the testing. And then, we couldn't control the amount of doors that they would have open, because occasionally, students would have the door open, or teachers would have the doors open, or they would be testing until they'd have the doors closed. So you can't really control how the doors were being used to ensure that the radon concentrations in those classrooms were the same and consistent. So that also is a possible source of error. And, so, and a little bit with hers, we also did sometimes on the weekend. So again, that plays into part with the doors being opening, opened and closed. Oh, and further on, our, our amount of testings we did in our classrooms resulted in actual professionals coming to our classrooms and school to actually have to start testing our own schools. So that is a little bit of an issue with the administration. <laughs> but <laughs> we're not gonna, we're just gonna gloss over that. We are hoping that our results are a little around the range. I, we, again, we can't really tell how accurate they are until our results come, well, until their results come in and compare with ours. So, any questions? Yes. Um, did you take into account any windows in the classroom? We thought about that, but then we have also the same problem with the doors. We have students or teachers that have the doors open or doors closed or windows, and there are some classrooms that have no windows, so you can't really control that as a factor in our thing. And also during the winter, mostly teachers avoid opening the windows, so we took that into consideration. Because our school runs off of a, off of a boiler, so the amount of heat kind of depends and we try to keep as much heat in the schools as possible. <coughs> yes? So when you measured the radon in the crawl spaces, did you find the correlation between that with like the classrooms that were above the crawl spaces? Like, so do you think since they were... The one directly kind of above it, there was a room, do you want to go back to the map? Uh, this, this, one. this room, number, the room 31, we actually tested room 33, and it was a really high rating. It had no doors. It, well, it, didn't, it had no windows. windows. It had no windows, and it was 12.3 average. So we we went over and we saw that it was really concentrated in that room as well. Yes. So do you think that the, having doors open would be a major issue for classroom? It possibly might be, but it also could be due to the activity in that classroom and whether or not they have the heater on, which brings in the air, or their filtration systems, because we have, the science room has filtration systems, which could brought up, could brought either radon in or radon out. So we have no idea, possibly. Okay. So, um, your, uh, Go ahead. Uh, so your uh, findings of the school board is now in the timing the Yes. Yes, they already brought people in to, they brought testing over like I think it's a, it was a week they brought little packets in they hung them up all over our school 
in different classrooms and it was a very shorter, it was a lot shorter time frame than what we were testing because it was from, again, January to March that we were testing compared okay. to a week. Great job. This map shows um, the location of data taken on, on Linden Street. Obviously, towards the top of the map is the north side, and towards the bottom is Mount South, where you can find um, Mount Helena City Park. And then our school, St. Andrew School, is outlined in yellow. And the <coughs> elevation data was provided by the Lewis and Clark County GIS Department. So here is a graph that shows air quality, how air quality varies with elevation. Unfortunately, we have, we do have some missing data for April 11th on Euclid, Cannon, and Shoto Streets. And that is because our dilos ran out of batteries. And so, in general, there is a trend for all this. There's a trend for the the, 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 day, the three days, and that is that the air quality improves as you go up, go up in elevation. And so this graph shows how temperature affects air quality, but please note that the x-axis is reversed, where university, which is the highest elevation, is on the left instead of the right. In gen um, so on April 11th, um, which was the warmest day. Um, it had the worst air quality that day, so. But it still averaged as a good AQI of 24. Okay, so um, overall, we couldn't quite find an inversion according to the temperature. The temperatures on the different streets were pretty erratic. And that could be because inversions usually happen in still weather, and on the days we took these measurements, we had an average wind speed of seven miles per hour. 
We did find that there was a temperature spike closer to Euclid, which is at a lower elevation. And that could be because that is a larger street with more cars releasing fuels. And it is also a paved street, which soaks up solar energy and can release heat. And all of the streets at the higher elevations are dirt, and then the ones at lower elevations are paved. Even though we couldn't find an inversion in, shown in the temperatures, we could find one a little bit in the air quality, because at the lower elevations there was a worse air quality. This could be explained by the higher number of cars at the lower elevation, as I said before, but at the higher elevations it's dirt roads, which causes a lot of particulate matter, so it's significant that despite that, there was still high or worse air quality at the lower elevations. So these are just pictures of us taking measurements. And you can see that in, we're on paved roads, but behind us in the one picture, you can see that it's dirt all behind us. And you can also see the slope of the hill and that we're all taking our measurements at the intersections or at the telephone poles because that's where you can find exact elevation data. So the three things that we did um, our project. It was very windy, so no temper, temperature inversion could have been found. If we were to revisit this project and retake data on less windy days, we could find a temperature inversion. And the temperatures in Hel temperature inversions in Helena usually include calm and cold weather conditions, and they're found in the valley. Um, we did this project on dirt and paved roads, as you can see in the picture. And if we were to do a different project, we could test how dirt roads differ from paved roads. And um, with all the different pollutants in Helena, such as dirt roads, wood stoves, and mass amounts of wildfires, air quality is important to Helenans to keep Montana safe. If we were to find a temperature inversion in Helena, it could be the first step in correcting the air quality in Helena. And these are our references. Questions? I'm so sorry, what days did you test again? The three days, which month was it in? April. It was in April, okay, and were they all at the same time? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Why do you think the inversion inversion helps clean the air or help solve the problem? So basically, inversions—it's um, when the warmer air is above the colder air, and that traps pollution underneath the warmer air. And a lot of people live in the Helena Valley, and so it causes more pollution to be there, and it causes more people to breathe to breathe that pollution. So if we could find where the inversion was, then we might be able to find ways to solve it and help the people not be breathing polluted air. All right. Thank you. Paper and colored construction paper, which type will burn with the less PM 2.5 levels? Okay, so our experiment, we burned white computer paper, colored construction paper, and lime paper to see which had the lowest PM 2.5 levels. Uh, the material we used was the dialysis air monitor, the multicolored construction paper, white computer paper, lime paper, a burn barrel, and a lighter. Okay, so our hypothesis is that we think out of the three different kinds of paper that the white computer paper will produce the lowest PM 2.5 levels while burning. We think this because this type of paper is the thinnest, so it will burn the fastest and have the most complete combustion and therefore produce the lowest PM 2.5 levels. So this is our location. We placed the dialos air monitor approximately four feet away from the burn barrel that we used. Our procedure was, the monitor ran for 10 minutes before we started. We burned the construction paper for five minutes. We waited five minutes before burning again. Steps two and three were repeated two more times with the construction paper. Steps two and three were repeated three more times with the white computer paper and three times with the lime paper. Okay, so this is a graph of our construction paper. So this is an average of all of the trials that we did with the construction paper. 
Um, and we started burning at minute one, and then we put the last piece of paper in around minute seven. Um, the humidity was 71%, and the control group was 3.04 PM 2.5, um, which is the 10 minutes before I started the experiment. So this is our graph for the white paper. The humidity and the control group stayed the same throughout all of our experiments. And you can see the white paper is in the red, and the EPA 24-hour standard is at 35, and that's the purple line. And this is the graph for the line paper. The humidity and the control group stayed the same. The dark green is the line paper, and then the light green is the EPA 24-hour standard. So we combined the graphs to make it easier to compare. And so the blue line is the construction paper, the red is the white paper, the green is the line paper, and the um, EPA 24-hour standard is still in the purple. Okay, so this just makes it easier to read. So you can see the white paper had the lowest amounts of PM2.5, while the line paper had the most. Our conclusion was although the white computer paper produced the lowest PM 2.5 levels out of the three papers, there was not a significant difference in all the papers. So if we were to do this experiment again, we could have emptied the ash at the bottom of the barrel before we started um, in between tests, and we could have waited more time between burnings to make sure that it was all the way back to normal, and we could have burned each paper more times for more samples. Any questions? Yeah, in the back. Well, we tried to burn like the same amount. We just did enough just so the fire would keep burning. So as one went out, we just had another one and we kept it uh, the same throughout all of our control systems. Oh, what made you want to do this experiment? Um, so, like, for when you start fires or whatever, and I don't know, we just wanted to see if it would make a difference at all. Uh, it was just the paper. Um, I don't think you said it, maybe you didn't do it, but I think one thing that would be interesting would be to weigh the paper and get a mass of material burned, because I would guess the construction paper would be a lot heavier than the white computer paper. And so you could be getting some reading or some correlation between air quality and just the mass, like biomass. Yeah, we didn't weigh that, but our teacher brought that up to us after we oh, really? finished it. <laughs> so interesting. What? The weight paper? Um, maybe, but we did not weigh it, so. Any other questions? Oh, yeah? Where's the construction paper? Were they all the same color? No, there was different colors. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Nathan McCarty. I'm Sydney Britton. And I'm Michaela Peterson. Uh, we're from Big Sky High School, and we decided to do our project on the effects of particulate matter on the number of respiratory cases in Missoula, Montana. So our first question was, how does the measurement of small particle matter correct the number of respiratory cases to get at St. Patrick's Hospital? Background information, we use the Dylos PM2.5 monitor to measure. So this uh, monitor, of course, measures small particles and large particles, and we decided to analyze the small particles. Uh, as far as the respiratory cases go, we had a contact at St. Patrick's Hospital in the urgent care unit. And we uh, emailed her about it and decided that our applicable cases uh, were patients that had coughing, shortness of breath, or an overall respiratory acid complaint. And the reason we focused on the small particles was because small particles can get into the alveoli, which is where gas exchange occurs into the, in the lungs. And in some cases, these small particles can even get into the bloodstream. The experiment. Our procedure was first to record um, this information for 60 minutes at the four locations, collect data every first and last Sunday of the month for a six-month course period starting in October and ending in April, and then we also recorded data from the Montana government website, and then for respiratory cases, we obtained the number of respiratory cases from St. Patrick's Hospital, and then we analyzed each of the cases to find out which ones were applicable in terms of air quality. 
So our location where Boyd Park, the University of Montana Oho, Carol's Park and the Courthouse. Variables are independent variables for the day's recorded locations, dependent variables for the particulate matter measurements, temperature, and number of respiratory cases. Confounding variables are things we cannot control, such as natural disasters. And as we're in Missoula, um, smoke was a big issue for us this summer and throughout the course of this past. And then respiratory cases, such as like psychological issues or pre-existing conditions. Uh, our hypothesis is that if the air quality is deemed bad or hazardous, then the number of patients with condition, conditions related to air quality will increase since uh, small particles affect the respiratory system by getting deep into the lungs. Data analysis. This is a graph analyzing the particulate matter averages versus the number of respiratory cases. So as you can see, our x-axis is the month and the day. And then the left y-axis is the number of respiratory cases, and this is for the blue columns. And then the right y-axis is for the number of small particles, and that, once again, is for the red like lines. And we saw no overall trend in this graph. However, in the middle of the data, we noticed a two-week delay. So this graph is a little odd, but it shows our data that we collected uh, versus the data collected by the Montana government. That one is on the x-axis. So the reason there is no trend line is because we couldn't find the proper variables to calculate exactly what the Montana government was calculating. Since we are doing it by simply the numbers of particles, they are doing it by the weight of particles. And we didn't have that technology with us or the variables, so. So these graphs show the particulate matter taken by the Montana government versus the number of hospital cases. As, as you can see, there's no obvious correlation. And this lab, last graph show the location versus the rest of the cases. And we can see that pretty much all the location follow the same path, but there is no correlation again between the location and the rest of the cases. So our conclusion is that our data rejects the hypothesis and about discussing this. Uh, we can prove this for two categories, human error and other variables. So we had a loss of battery on two occasions. Uh, but we were able to like charge it and then go back during the same day So that way we still got at least closer data and there's also several instances of human interaction with the machine At one point we had like a seven-year-old take the machine and start walking away <laughs> On another occasion an elderly gentleman went up to the machine kicked it over and then walked away <laughs> So uh, this definitely could have affected our data um, Other variables include allergens or any other respiratory issues that people could have treated themselves and instead not going to hospitals. And there's also natural disasters from smoke blowing in from other areas, but as well as people from out of Missoula coming into Missoula for treatment. Here are our references. And we'd also like to give a special thank you to Christy Berkeley, who is our contact at St. Patrick's Hospital and gave us the information for patient data. Any questions? but we were barely getting to that uh, amount of time. Sometimes it'd just go like 14 and some odd seconds. So we wanted to make sure that we had a full 15 minutes. So we rounded up to another minute. Oh. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh yeah, and just a side note, we ended up with 704 data points, or minutes of data. <laughs> so that was so fun. <laughs> Yeah, can hear you. Can, can everybody? Okay, so mainly we didn't really uh, ask, we 
No, so we didn't really do the flu or any other uh, things. We tried to stray away from other factors that could have caused a respiratory issue. So like I said, uh, we focused on just like if coughing was a thing or just shortness of breath overall or they felt br br funny breathing or just if it, yeah, so if they just majorly had a problem with the respiratory. Any more? Right. Thank you. Okay, so that is it for the presentations. Um, two things real fast before we dismiss you for lunch. And lunch is waiting out there. So real fast, we would like to recognize our, our judges, and we're going to announce, uh, bring them up one at a time. This is Dr. Earl Adams, who's going to announce our judges. And we just want to do a quick out. recognition of our judges, and then um, we'll release you guys for lunch, and we'll compile the scores. Um, for our PowerPoint judges who come up, come up, Ronnie, Ben, Mary, Bobby, and uh, Aaron, we'd like to just present them with a little token of appreciation. So much fun that he can't stay away. So he's back. So welcome back, Brett. Um, and then there's just a whole bunch of other stuff, uh, people. So Heidi is sitting over there. Heidi? Okay. And, and I'll, also, before we give away the awards, just like to recognize a couple of people. Um, uh, specifically, Montana Department of Environmental Quality. So Bonnie Rouse. Thank you, Bonnie, once again. Bonnie and, and uh, Montana DEQ uh, generously uh, fund the symposium every single year. So thanks again, Bonnie. Couldn't happen without you. And then uh, National Institute of Health Science Education Partnership Award. So thank you. <laughs> okay. So I'd like to recognize our teachers, and I would like to bring up each one and hold your applause until they're they're all up here. Uh, you can. Don't hold your applause. You can clap as much as you want to. So first of all, big guy, Dave Jones, Shelby Ryburn, and uh, Brian Ferger.
And then Kate Matter from Anaconda. Kate. Noelle Glidewell from Valley Christian. <laughs> Renee Rose from Libby High School. Then <laughs> Christy Buffington from St. Andrews. So it's up to it's kind of up to these guys every single year to the, the success that we have as a program. I mean, these guys are awesome. You're very lucky to have them as your teachers. So thank you very much.
Now for second place. This was interesting. This is a battle for first and second place. Fraction of a point. So, second place from Capitol High School, Blaze Murphy, Chase Nielsen, and Miles Clark.